from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's teaching social emotional learning through music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, we welcome author, educator, and equity advocate Franklin Willis. Please welcome our host of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, Scott Edgar. Welcome to our next episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music. Today, folks, you know, the pandemic has had a lot of effects on all of us, and there have been a few shining stars and shining voices that have emerged. And even before the pandemic, but since, there has been a voice of inspiration, of equity, of providing us a path through this trauma that we're experiencing. And that person is Franklin Willis. And we are so fortunate to have Franklin join us as our guest today. Franklin, welcome. Hey, what's up, Scott? Thanks for the opportunity to come and share and chat today. This is definitely at the top of the list of cool things uh, uh, to, to be a part of. And, and Franklin, the word that I love there was chat. You know, we want this to be, you know, push back, give it to me, and, and, and let's just start talking. Um, you know, you, your world, you know, you, it started off in Nashville, Tennessee as an elementary general music teacher, and from there, entrepreneur, advocate, e- uh, equity uh, advocate on that perspective, and then just universal rock star. So in your words, can you tell us just a little bit about your journey? Well, you know, Scott, this, um, my journey began at church, honestly. Um, that was my first love of music. It was honed, it was developed um, in church choir. My mom made sure that I was there every week. Um, so you went to choir, you went to Bible study. But in church choir, uh, Mr. Ronnie Yates is his name. And he was not a, you know, licensed music teacher. He was a local musician who had a love a deep love for teaching children and teaching music. And um, he was kind of the first example that I saw of musical excellence and what it meant to be a teacher, a director, a person that cared about you as a human being. So um, through that experience, I, that was my first music ed experience. And then when I got you know more serious about it, I went to National School of the Arts and met Mr. Michael Graham, who was my choir teacher there. And in his class, that's when I discovered that, hey, I want to be a music teacher. And um, the long story short is I went to uh, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga um, my first couple of years and flunked out horribly. I mean, it was party time. I was away from home. But through that experience, I met one of my life mentors, Dr. Roland Carter, who um, pretty much just snatched me up and said, hey, what are you doing? You have all this talent, all these skills, but you are not tapping into your abilities. And um, really gave me that real talk I needed to hear. He probably was saying the same thing my parents were saying, but for some reason as kids, when we hear it from somebody else, it is just so uh, much more rich and meaningful. And so he told me, either you're gonna stay here and get it together or you need to move on and find another school that's gonna better support you and I ended up at University of Memphis, and um, I know you had Dr. Nicole Robinson on uh, on a couple of shows ago, but she was my advocate. She was the teacher that um, really poured into me during my undergrad years, and um, kind of helped me through my music ed experience through the the sight singing and the theory and all of these play things that were foreign to me, the music history, and um, she made it her mission that I student taught with two African-American men who were um, fantastic at what they do and provided me the foundation to see what could be possible for a Black music teacher, a Black male music teacher. So shout out to Mr. Galen Robinson and Mr. Anthony Richardson, who I talk to to this day um, just because of their um, um, mentorship and their ability to just keep it real with me hey, this is what you're going to go into. You may didn't learn this in the classroom, but this is what you'll experience day one. And so from there, I taught in North Memphis on a, at Valentine Elementary. I say that's a lot of the on-the-job training. Um, those students and those families and the teachers in that community, um, they just 
they grabbed me and, and just pulled me close. And I, and I learned so much through my first year of teaching. And then like, like everybody else, I wanted to move home here in Nashville and change the world. <laughs> so I came back here to Nashville and taught um, in an underserved community um, and, and truly began to find my voice as a music teacher. And then I wanted to venture out into middle school choral land and did five years of choral music and general music and, you know, did the festivals and, you know, the trips and, and all of that good stuff. Um, but I found that I missed that elementary music experience. I miss having the xylophones and the drums and the creativity that can happen through the off process. Um, so I went back to elementary music and since then I've just been in a constant uh, uh, windmill or circle or cycle of just creativity. And um, it's funny you mentioned uh, through the pandemic, I, I created my Instagram account and my Facebook account because I was finding that my personal account was becoming more of a business account. And so through that, I've been sharing my experiences as a music teacher and um, connecting with music teachers across the country, sharing resources, sharing ideas and perspectives to give them a new lens of what music education can be for elementary music teachers and students. And so through that, um, I've been able to connect with organizations, universities, and uh, community partners and sharing this, this love and my passion for music teaching. And through that, um, doors have opened and um, my relationships have been you know, forged and created. And so um, it is my service and my duty and my call, I should say my passion that, that I share this experience with folks because music changed my life. It gave me a voice at a time where I was trying to figure everything out, right? My dad wanted me to play football and I went to that first <laughs> football practice in high school and I'm like, wait a minute, they're knocking each other's heads off and like, wait a minute, this is not, this is not my thing, right? And um, my dad was hurt by that, but my mom was like, you have to do what is important to you. And so I've told this story before, but in uh, one of my years of teaching, with the CMA Foundation, I was able to uh, perform, my students were able to perform at the CMA Fest here in Nashville in the biggest stage. And I guess where it was at? It was at the Nissan Stadium, where what? Football is played. So to see my dad there, it was like a full circle moment where music education still brought me to a space in which he loved, right? And so um, to see my dad there and just that whole experience of seeing my students perform on that stage, um, that's not possible without the, the, the power of music. So that's my short story. I am a very long-winded person, <laughs> um, but but that that's that's the quick story. I love it, and you know, knowing where you are now and the great work that you're doing now, it is so clear through your story how that came to be, the mentors that you've had in your life, the experiences. You know, when we talk about SEL, so many people think, oh, everybody gets a hug. Isn't this nice? No, we need people yeah. to give us a swift kick sometimes. And that's what yeah. this is about. It's about skill building. It's to be there and nurture when we need to be nurtured. And it's about being there to push us uh, and to give us the skills to move on. And so, th you know, just a tangible example and seeing that it started with your young experiences in the church and, and seeing music ed in just so many different incarnations. Uh, if I just had to kind of put a nice bow on, on what you said is it's all about opening doors. It's all about thinking about different spaces that maybe we've had a little bit too narrow of music mm -hmm. education definition so far. Absolutely. And this idea that it has to fit into a box that, that, you know, you have to do these things to be successful. And that is what, you know, I steered away from around year four or five. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm just replicating what everybody else is doing. That is not working for my students. So the moment I began to listen to the feedback that the kids were telling me, and sometimes the feedback is not, hey, Mr. Willis, this lesson sucks. Sometimes the feedback is the body language, right? 
sometimes the feedback is when they're getting off the bus, do they even speak to you? <laughs> Are they trying to avoid having eye contact with you? When you walk into the cafeteria to get a salad, our kids waving at you. You know, all of that is that cultural language that sometimes as music teachers, we forget. And we stay sometimes focused on, you know, the standards. I got to teach the quarter note. I got to teach the eighth note. And for me, it was, if I could teach to the soul of the child, then the quarter notes and the eighth notes, that was, that was easy, right? If, if I'm teaching and you don't like me or you don't understand me um, and where I'm coming from, there was a, a loss. There was a loss there. It was, it was not um, a place where learning could truly take place. And we're taught in our college program, don't smile to December, right? Go in, be firm and, and do all of these things. But when you do that, you create barriers. And for me, I'm all about building bridges, right? So you may not like this particular music, but I want you to understand the historical aspects of it. I want you to understand the story. I want you to know who the composer is. And through that story, you may grow a love or a, a liking to this particular piece of this music. But if I'm just giving it to you, you know, one and two and three E and a four is very robotic. There's not enough time. There's not a, a, a place for you to grow and put your voice into the music. So um, that, that for me is so key that we continue to find our teacher voices. And when I say teacher voices, I'm saying, what is your identity in music education? What will you bring to the music education space? Of course, we want to mimic and, and honor those teachers that you know, taught us all of these great, these strategies, these rehearsal techniques. But if you're just doing it exactly the way they did it, where's the fun in that? Where is the identity? So for me, that's, that first three to five years of teaching was like, wait a minute, what's my voice in this? How am I going to impact my students, not just through music, but that they will be lifelong learners and that they see the brilliance in each other they see the, the the wonderful things that can happen through music education. The the words that you're using right now, teaching to the soul, and then identity being at the heart of that. You, so much of what we talk about when we talk about SEL is that you know in in the past we used to talk about it as self others decision making, and that's not to put too fine a point on it. That's a cold way of putting it. That's the quarter notes and the eighth yeah. notes. But when we look at what it looks like in our world. It's about identity, belonging, and agency, and that identity building for ourselves as teachers. The, the biggest thing, my takeaway when I was listening to what you were just saying was that we need to shut up sometimes, that we need to ask questions, that we need to listen, and that we need to co-construct and co-create our classroom environments and listen harder than we speak. That is key, and I, always, I have a term, we don't teach robots, we teach children. And when we give the children the opportunity to speak, oh, Scott, they say a lot of stuff, right? When we give them the opportunity to create, they come up with some amazing things. Like I, I tell people this all the time, when I do orphan arrangements and I share things, I'm like, that's the ostinato that I came up with. Sure, you can use it but I know your children will come up with something that's way better. Let them take it and morph it into whatever they see fit as musical making experience. And so this idea that only teachers hold the knowledge in the room, we may be the only ones with the degree, but our children bring so many rich cultural experiences, musical experiences, ideas, thoughts, perspectives, they bring all of that with them. And when we tap into that, we create ownership. And for me, that was the biggest piece. Because when they have ownership, they're going to make sure it's at the best of their abilities. They're going to make sure, they're going to listen intensively to make sure that, oh, Mr. Willis, can we go back and do that again? I heard something that wasn't quite what I wanted it to be. And it may be something that I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Oh, can we just do it one more time, please, please, please? That's where that love and that ownership comes. And when we do that, we spark diversity of thought. We get students to see other people's experiences. 
we get students to say, oh, I didn't think about it like that. Whoa, let's try that again. And so for me, that is the joy of teaching because then the students become the teacher and we're just facilitating the learning, right? I'm just in the space and I'm soaking up all of this, this amazingness and all of this brilliance. Franklin, how are you crawling inside of my head and just putting everything into such perfect words? The, you know, I, I used to say that SEL gives our students voices and then a dear friend of mine up here slapped me upside the head and said, Scott, no, our kids have voices. We just silence them. And everything you're saying right now is just how do we amplify our students' voices in our classrooms? Man, that's a word right there. Because, and I... I've been I've been a part of that group of teachers um, that said, you know, it has to be this way. You have to come to class. You have to have your pencil. You have to have your photo, right? Thinking that that's setting expectations. And one one year I said, wait a minute. I've spent a whole two weeks at the beginning of the year telling students what they can't do. You can't do this. You can't do that. What about the things they can't? What can they do in my role? And so from that point on, on create procedures, expectations, uh, structures. Students, what do you feel is the best way we should do that? How, how should we go to our orchestra instrument? How should we get the rhythm stick for this activity? What makes sense, right? And when you do that, that's when that buy-in comes in. And so um, giving students, I like that you said that. We silence them, we really do. And it's not that we are trying to, we're trying to maintain order. <laughs> We're trying to make sure they know that we're in charge, right? But I think that's a, a balance because you can't have all of just one. It has to be a balance of, of both. So you brought ORF up a couple of times, and I've had the pleasure to work with some fabulous ORF instructors and talk about how SEL and ORF are just peanut butter and jelly. Can you talk just a little bit about how you used the ORF process, use the ORF process to facilitate these life skills that we hope our students come with after our classes? So the thing about the ORF process for me is you, create, you give them um, just a little bit. So you give them um, a chant or you give them a speech activity or you give them some body percussion. And then you say, what's next? What, what, what are we doing, right? So you give them the tools that they need. And then from there, they say, well, wait a minute. If we put that four beat phrase with this four beat phrase, can we hear how that sounds? And then you have an eight beat phrase. And then you say, well, wait a minute. Well, what if I wanted to create another four beat? And so you're giving them the tools and you're giving them the, um, the I, not necessarily the ideas, but you're giving them the process. And once you give them the process, they can create so much. Um, and then the other thing with, with the ORF process is it's, um, for me, this is one of my things. I do, we do, and then you do. So if the teacher is not, man, I don't, let me just say it this way. You have to model everything you want to see, right? You can't just say, all right, sing that piece. Well, how do you want me to sing it? Do you want me to sing it softly? Do you want me to sing it loudly? Um, is it with one? Is it with one complete uh, phrase with no breath? No. This is how I want you to sing it: standing tall, whatever. So you give them the structure, and then from there we do it together. And then now I'm gonna see if you can do it. And as the teacher, um, the the biggest component is making sure that they know that you're in the learning with them. Mr. Willis, wait a minute, you didn't sing it that way. <laughs> I've had kids say that. Um, Mr. Willis, can you play that one more time? Absolutely. And so then they get the process and once they have the process, and this happens at the beginning of the year, once they have the process, as you're growing and evolving throughout that school year, they'll know, oh, Mr. Willis sings it first, I sing it, we sing it together, and then they do it, especially with movement. And that's another thing I love about ORF is the creativity of movement, right? So I can do a move, Scott, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'll do a move, and then you do, you do a different move. <laughs> so right there, right there, can you put that on the stage? 
Absolutely. And it doesn't take much work. So it's giving, it's taking less words and giving them more uh, creative thought and creative process for them to create. Um, I know the Orphees out there may be like, oh my God, Franklin, you just totally butchered the Orph process. But for me, it's all about how can I get out of the way? How can I give you something and then let you run with it and see? And so I, let me say this, whenever I do a piece, I can remember with a fourth grade class, uh, we were preparing for a spring concert or something like that. And I was teaching the piece to all the classes. Well, when it came time to do the performance, each class ended up with something completely different. And so what it ended up being was every class shared their piece. And so that showed the magic of the ORF process to the parents. And so that's what it's all about. So when I would do workshops and I do clinics, I make sure to tell people, this is the Franklin Willis arrangement, right? This is how my kids ended up doing it. How your students do it may be completely different, and that's fine. You know, hula hoops for me are for uh, movement, not for jumping through. And what you just said was exactly right. It's okay if we have different interpretations. And I think oftentimes we get trapped in this idea of standardization, that every single student needs to jump through the same hoop, jump over the same bar. And the answer is no. Students bring their unique skill sets, and it's okay if they interpret something a little bit differently or a lot differently. And, and I think we, we have to name it. It's the, 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 the whiteness, the, the construct of this is what music education was 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And this idea that music education can only be this. And that's where I fight back and I say, wait a minute, because if music education can only be that, what about my students? That doesn't speak to them. That doesn't speak to their reality their current circumstance and the things that they are living through, going through at this moment. So that may be music education for you, but that's not all that it can be for me. And so um, I, I think now we're in a space of actually listening. Some folks are not listening and learning. They're passive listening. They hear it. It goes through one ear and it goes out the other. They think it doesn't apply to them. Um, but this idea that we are all growing and we are we never reach a moment of hey i got it all figured out no we are continuously trying to figure out what works best with this group of students what works with teachers and um that is the continuous learning part when students see that we're still learning and we're still figuring it out and it's okay to make mistakes it's okay but once you know better you must do better so don't make that same mistake again. Make sure you know your students' names, right? <laughs> if you find out what microaggressions are, stop doing it, right? <laughs> it's, it's that piece for me that we, we have to continuously do the work. And I think that's been normalized now. I think so many people are seeing positive examples of saying, you know, I'm going to say something wrong. You know, probably as part of this series, I've said a lot of things wrong and people have come back and said, well, Scott, you really can't say that or that's not how we're framing that these days. And we learn and we grow and the openness, I think, is critical. It kind of goes back to what you were just saying, Franklin, about being a musical model. We need to be a life model for our students. And it doesn't mean that we have all the answers. It doesn't mean that it's all rose colored glasses. We can be vulnerable. We can make mistakes. But it's important for our students to see that, too. And, and I can't stress the importance of when they see that we make a mistake and we own it. It gives them the agency and the knowledge to go through life. And when things don't go as planned, they know they have some, some reference to, oh, yeah, Mr. Willis, I remember in class that time, he tried to sing that piece and it just was horrible. And he laughed it off. He said, let's start again. <laughs> I had a second grade teacher I worked with and her model with her students was, it's cool, right? So this idea that 
you know, hey, you might not get an A plus on this on every assignment. It's cool. We're learning. We're still adapting and we're evolving. And um, I, I know when we get that degree, we think I have made it to the mountaintop. I am the man. I have did it. I have conquered this unimaginable goal. But then when you get in front of those kids, you realize, wait a minute, I don't know much at all. And this idea, um, I was talking about this with a colleague a couple of weeks ago, um, especially for me as a black man, I had experiences in church that prepared me for teaching. But through the collegiate experience, a lot of that was stripped from me because I thought I had to fit this mold. I, I had to pass the practice test. I had to pass the teaching exams. I had to do all of this stuff. So in the forefront of my mind is all of these things that I learned that I thought I had to do. So when I got back into the same atmosphere, the same demographic of students who look like me, I'm trying to do all the stuff I learned in college that was not working. I had to tap back into, wait a minute, how did you, how did you learn music? How did you experience music? It wasn't. One and two and seven, six, eight, eight, and four and five and two. Good, but you learn through call and response. You learn through echoing. You learn through the rote process. And the idea that that's not okay, that's that's a, a European, a, 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 a whiteness, a construct, a system, right? That is valid, just as valid as so far me, Rado. Right. And so merging those two and owning my story allowed me to break through and find my teacher voice and breaking through those those notions that I that I didn't you know, own up to or that I didn't um, um, allow myself to to own. It kept me in bondage. It kept me not creating with my students. But the moment I began to own it and say, you know what? No. Mm -mm. My students can sing four part harmony and they also can do a rap by Drake, right? <laughs> they can also sing an Italian folk song and they also can do a spiritual. All of those things can happen within the same music classroom. And so um, I, sometimes I get labeled as, oh, that's the hip hop guy. <laughs> but the true essence is I can do hip hop, I can do rock and roll, and I can do it tastefully and I can do it and make sure that students understand and learn from that experience and then be able to use those experiences in their life. And so um, give me a set of kids, I'm gonna find a way. It may take some time, but I'm gonna find a way to speak their music language. I'm gonna find a way to figure out how can I get them to tap into the brilliance and the talent that I know that is within them. And when you do that, you have kids, you have, they'll be yours forever. They'll, they'll do what, they'll jump as high, they'll sing whatever the music you want to sing, and they will go through that journey because they know it's not just about the music, right? Mr. Willis cares about me as a person. He cares about who I am. And I'm going to say this, Scott, because a lot of students are, I mean, a lot of teachers are going back um, in person, and, and I've been seeing a lot of posts. You know, I've been out of school since March. And I've been asking teachers this, what are students bringing with them to school? Not backpacks, pencils, and notebooks, and paper, but the things that we can't see, right? So, so homelessness, um, food insecurity, poverty, um, abuse, all of these things they're bringing with them in our classroom. And then we have the audacity to just focus on the music. Right? And, and get upset when they're not engaged. And we're talking about children, right? And this idea that children have to be adults, whew, I could talk all, so long about that. We have to give them the opportunity in our classes to feel, to express, to show, to give them the, the opportunity to say, Mr. Willis, I'm not feeling well today because, right? And when they feel that they can be their true self, that is when the learning process takes on a whole nother meaning for me, right? It's great that your kids can do Eric Whitaker and they can do all of these things, but do they know that you truly care? 
do they know that you will be there for them? Or is it all about the music? And for me, it just can't be about the music. And I know when I share my story and I share my experiences with my kids, they know that Mr. Willis is a human being too. He has problems, he has issues. And, and furthermore, if students are bringing that much with them, what are teachers bringing with, what are we bringing? And so this idea that once we get in the music room, we have to put on this you know, persona, and for, for a certain circumstances, of course you do. But this idea that we have to be robots and we can't be empathetic and we can't um, share our story, when kids know that, man, Mr. Willis grew up like me too, right? He, he barely got into college as well. But once he got into college, he got, he had ideas. He had, it, it shows them that what is possible. And um, I know I just kind of went everywhere and I got deep on us, but, but the thing is, we have such powerful voices and we have opportunities to change um, the trajectory of kids' lives by allowing them to experience music in a different way. So powerful. And and one of my mantras these days is needs before notes, that we, we have to get through everything that we're bringing into our classroom on our backs, on our shoulders, that isn't the backpack. And then we'll get back to the notes. We're music teachers. We'll get back to the notes. But for right now, there's too much going on in our world. You know, I want to get back to something that you're that's you, you were talking about just a second, and, and this is the idea, you know, the term that we're throwing around in, in, in the field right now is decolonizing, decolonizing music ed in a way that we get outside of this white Eurocentric definition of music education. So can you tell us just a little bit of your thoughts about the necessity, and you've already started down this road, decolonizing music ed, but more importantly, what diversity and equity needs to look like in our field? Well, this idea of being culturally responsive, that is such a buzzword, but you can't be culturally responsive if you don't know the culture. You have to embrace this idea that, man, I am behind, right? I don't know everything. And for me, diversity is not just cutting on a hip hop song because you have black students, right? <laughs> like trying to get street cred. And I've had teachers do that, and it's turned out horribly because they know that you're only doing it for cool points. You're only doing it to 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 show that you're hip, but you don't really understand where the music comes from, right? And so um, diversity and equity and inclusion for Franklin is the idea of listening. I said this before, of listening to your students and their their needs and their and their ideas and, and their reality. Um, I remember teaching in middle school and thinking that I could just, you know, I, I did it too, hip hop. I'm gonna do some hip hop with my kids. And I had some football players in choir who just gave me a run for my money. I mean, I, I tried everything, Scott, with those, with those guys. But it wasn't until I went to football games and I sat in the stands with their families and I rooted them on and cheered them on. And they saw that, wait a minute, Mr. Willis, is that the game? And he participated, he talked to my mom and my pop. Like, wait a minute, Mr. Willis, you, you all right with me. I'm gonna try this music thing. I might not love it, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to sing and I might be off pitch, but I'm gonna try. And that built community, that built camaraderie. And so a lot of it is being uncomfortable. And a lot of teachers steer away from being uncomfortable, but it's in those moments of being uncomfortable that you find what works. And so the idea, if you see that it's not working, stop doing it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, it's so simple, but we get so bound up in being politically correct and being, um, you know, I've had teachers say, a white teacher specifically, can I teach hip hop? Yes, you can teach hip hop. Is it going to be uncomfortable? Yes. We are students say, wait a minute, you probably ain't never listened to nothing like this before, right? Yeah, they may say that. But then that's an opportunity for you to say, yes, I have not listened to this before, 
but I am so intrigued and I've learned so much through this experience, right? So it's this idea that, um, and I think Dr. Hess said it in, in her cultural competence, in the idea of trying to do these things, um, sometimes we miss the mark. And, and we're trying to meet our students' needs, but we don't quite know how to do it because that's not our life experience. And so, but if you tell your students and be authentic about it and share with them that, you know, I don't know this, I don't know gospel music, but I've reached out to some community partners who sing gospel music and they're gonna come into our space and they're gonna share and I'm gonna learn with you. Does that give you street credit? Will your students say, I can roll with that? Absolutely, and especially in this virtual space now, you can have authors, you can have music teachers, culture bearers. If you don't know what that is, that's just someone who, they may not have a music ed degree, but they have the lived experience of being in that culture and understanding that music. And so instead of you trying to be the guru of all things, allow people into your space and then students see that you learn as well and we grow together. And it also can position the students to be the experts, that they can say, well, maybe I don't know about what we're talking about, but hey, let me tell you what I know in my world. And it absolutely starts to break down that teacher-student divide. And that is when the learning takes place. That's when the teaching takes place. And um, does it take time? Absolutely. It's not a cut on the light and it just happens. It happens through everyday experiences, right? Um, I, the, the quote from James Baldwin comes to mind, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. So a lot of these things that our students, they hear us say, but we don't follow up with action. When we hear a teacher in the hallway talking down about a student, right? Are we engaging with that conversation? Or are we stepping up for that student? And I have this, this idea that we show up for students publicly while privately we are wearing them out. <laughs> and so that, that students can read that, right? They can understand that you don't really care about me and you don't like me. And at the essence of that, that bleeds into the instruction. If I know you truly don't think I'm smart or that I can't do it, if I can't, that, that because of who I am or my makeup or my identity, you've already written me off, then why would I even try to prove you wrong? Some students have that, like I had a college professor, I was going to show this professor that mm, you got Franklin wrong. I'm going to show you that I'm great, right? But we also have those other students who say, man, what's the point? What's the use? And then we lose them. And not only do we lose them in music education, we lose them in education. And then they fall into the shuffle, right? And then they get mislabeled. And then they get put on the special list. They get put on that list of you don't want him in your class. And what that trickles down, it follows them. I've seen it firsthand. It follows them through elementary school. It follows them to middle school. It follows them to high school. So we can be the voice that changes that, right? We can be the voice that says, wait a minute, I think you got that student wrong. I've seen Franklin do some amazing things. I've seen Scott do some amazing things. But when you say this about Scott, it does trigger him. And when he's triggered, he's going to go off on you. Scott is going to show out in class because you have triggered him. So these are the trigger points. But when you give Scott leadership positions, when you give him the opportunity to pass out temples, when you tell Scott, great job, Scott takes that in, and then he shows it through his abilities, through his actions, that he cares about it. And so it's those things that we can do. And I'll say this, with those trouble students that we have, we all have them. Students that we just try everything, right? I learned that going to the student, the teacher who that student absolutely loves. There's an adult in the building that that kid absolutely loves. Find out, what are they doing? What is the language? What is, what is happening in that classroom space? Why does that student respect that teacher so much, right? And once you figure that out and you build that camaraderie, that relationship with that teacher, 
then you can start using some of those strategies in your instruction. And before you know it, you have built a relationship with that kid who then is like ready to rock, ready to roll, you know? Let me tell you one of my favorite parts of teaching. When a, t a colleague of mine comes up to me and says, oh, I'm so sorry, you have Steven this year. And I say, Steven's a rock star in my classroom. I love Steven. And that's that conversation. And we know that music gives us a leg up. Music gives us a head start. You know, we're cheating. Uh, but that's going to provide an entry point. But I love those conversations. And, and that other teacher saying, what's in the water in the music room? And we're saying, well, everything we're talking about today. And that's the key. And we do have a, a, a head start <laughs> because, you know, you can cut on an instrumental track and get your body percussion going on, get some echo clapping going on. And I found that there's always one student who is just amazing with rhythm. And then they do it and then it just passes. It's just, it's something that, um, can you do that in the general ed classroom? Absolutely. So um, it, it's this wonderful um, opportunity to share that music education has, has given me for, you know, who saw the best in me, right? Who saw that I cared. And then when they saw that I cared, they cared. And then I've had parents say, wait a minute, how did you know that he could sing like that? And I said, I, I, it just happens, right? And, and he could be singing in the shower and I'd be telling him to be quiet. Now I, I want him to sing all the time. And so we have just that secret sauce. We have that, that ability to, to unlock that and that confidence, right? That confidence that can transform a kid who was shy at the beginning of the school year, who can now stand up and say a poem and give a presentation by the end of the year. So it's those type of moments that, for me, music teaching has just been so, so, so wonderful. And and the other piece is you didn't tell the kid that he couldn't sing. You 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 expected that it was a skill that they had. So Franklin, you know you've hit a, a lot of what's in your heart and what you're doing, but you're wearing a shirt that has sort of become your mantra more than a music teacher. And my friend, I, I'm proud to have supported uh, and, and good to go and. Uh, totally believe in, in what you're doing. So can you tell us a little bit about what more than a music teacher means to you and how that's manifesting in a lot of your different avenues these days? Well, thank you for the support. You got to lift every voice. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, well, you know, it started off just, you know, I had a principal who I will keep <laughs> the name out of. <laughs> but I had a principal that said, you know, why are you doing all this? Like you're doing rehearsals after school, you're, you know, coming before school and working one-on-one -on -one with kids. You're allowing kids to come in on your lunch break while you can't even eat your lunch. Why are you, you know, you're just a music teacher. Just teach music and leave. And I said, wait a minute. No, I'm more than a music teacher. Music teaching is the avenue to create the relationship, right? But music teaching gives me the opportunity to connect with my students on a deeper level, right? I can go to football games. I can go to karate practice. I can go to basketball tournaments and see my kids and be just as happy as if I saw them performing on the stage or creating an ostinato in class. So um, it started off just with, with that. And I said, wait a minute, no, more than a music teacher. And some people see that. And I've had some music teachers say, what's wrong with just being a music teacher? And it's like, well, stay with me, listen, <laughs> look, listen up. Let me see. <laughs> um, but it's 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 just this idea that yes, we teach music, but it's so much more than that. And um, I, I from there, my sister said, you need to get a shirt that says more than a music teacher. I bet you know you, you just need to say that, and that needs to be your motto. So I put it on a shirt, and then next thing I know, music teachers. I'm like, wait a minute, I want one of those, and I want one of those. And so it turns into a small business, um, Prince Rhythm Company. Um, and what, what we produce is just empowering clothing that says that, yes, you teach music, but you're so much more than that. 
Uh, teaching music is what I do. It's not who I am. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy with just so much of the love and the support that has been given towards that. And, and it's just this idea, I keep saying that, I got to find me another word, but it's the perspective that you can be so much more than a music teacher. You can be a composer, you can be an arranger, you can be an author, i.e. Scott, social and emotional guru, right? And you don't have to have all of these other things to be that. You can be all of that and more. And so um, that is kind of where that, that model comes from. And um, I, I encourage and challenge music teachers to find out what more are you, right? Music teaching, that's part of your story, but what is the other part of your story? And share those with your students, your communities, your families, your neighborhoods, because they will embrace that. And then you have advocates for your program and advocates for you. And especially now when we're in the unfortunate times of having to advocate for music education, that's the invaluable piece. That's the invaluable piece when we have the communities, we have Mama Bear, we have Papa Bear, we have the kids, we have us. We're all speaking the same language. So there's one thing that came out in, in recent history, Edward's Rhythm Sticks. Uh, really, really excited about your book, author. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Shout out to Dr. Sarah Goulish, who is the founder and CEO of F Flat Books, um, which is a online music education public, uh, publishing company. And I found out about her work through Instagram, actually. Um, and she gives authors, music teachers, the opportunity to publish their work and to not go through the process of the, the academia, you know, all of that that comes with being a, a author and academic, right? Um, so it happened during quarantine last year. Um, my, this is a short story my wife bought. My son and I from Rhythm Sticks. And that kid could not put those rhythm sticks down. He clicked them up high. I got my rhythm sticks right here, actually. <laughs> he, I keep them, I keep them nearby because he's always ready to just jam out. And we'll cut on some music, and he would just get to clicking. And um, so I came up with this story about how he takes his rhythm sticks with him everywhere to church, to his grandparents, Glammy and Poppy. Um, take them to the barbershop, take them to church. And um, this idea that music can be made anywhere and it can be made with anyone. You don't have to have a score. You don't have to be in a choir or in a band to create your music. Music is everywhere. And that's one of the lines in the book. Um, and so students can embrace this idea that I'm a musician, I'm a music maker. I am important to the world, my story matters, my voice matters, and my music matters. And so that's the theme of the book. Um, and it's a short story and it, it has just blown my mind just how teachers are taking it and using it in their music rooms through virtual teaching, in-person teaching. Students are jamming with their rhythm sticks. Um, they're creating, they're creating you know, other stories from this. Because um, in the teaching guide, I asked students, how would you end this story? Edward, Edward found his sticks through branches on a tree when he lost them and started still jamming. But how would you end this story? What other things would you say? And um, students, they just take it and they, they run with it. So Edward's Rhythm Sticks has been a, a blessing um, that I needed. And, and it speaks to this idea. Here I go, it speaks to the idea, <laughs> to the perspective that um, music ed, it, it stripped us from everything that we thought we knew back in March, right? So like rehearsals and getting ready for performances and all of that. And I found myself like, man, I don't have an outlet to get any of this creativity out. But I wrote it down and, and I created this piece. For, for my son and, and it's dedicated to him. And also so that he can see himself in books, in curriculum, um, that, that black folks have stories other than pain, other than suffering. We have joy, we, we share families, we have rich histories and cultural experiences. And so 
that idea that that music making can happen with anybody and it can happen anywhere. And and um, Dr. Lewis sent me a a graphic of all of the places that has been purchased, and it just blew my mind. I mean, countries uh, that I pro that I can't even pronounce. I'm like, wait a minute, they have Edwards Rhythm Sticks over there too. And so um, it, it's this independent author journey has been you know, very fun, um, nerve wracking as well. Cause it's like, wait a minute, I don't really know what I'm doing. I just know I love this story and I want to share it. And so um, to all the music teachers out there who, you know, you have a passion or you have an idea, put it on paper and, and see what happens. Stop, stop second guessing yourself before it even can produce, right? Get that first draft and have it on paper and then grow from there. Um, so, I'm really living out this whole thing of being more than a music teacher. And, and I'm just so blessed. And shout out to Darlene, who in that new, man, I, I, it just has blown me away that something, she, she just, she's just brilliant. And I'm speaking about the, the new uh, introduction to the SEL book that Scott edited. And they released the introduction this week. And um, she quoted me in that piece. And, and it, it's just brilliant. I, I, I'm just, I'm still speechless, just, just, just by that. And um, but it shows by sharing your story, you have no idea who it will impact, and you don't know how it will impact them. And so your duty is just to live your life and be authentically you, and share your experience. And then from there, that's all. That's it. That's all you do. And from there. The rest is, is, is up to the creator and to the, the higher calling. I know some folks may not believe, but I truly believe in living as you're led. And if something comes back and, and somebody is hurt by what you said, you know, you embrace that and you say, wow, then that was not my intent, right? That was not my intention to do that. But you live with it, you accept it, and then you, if you know better, you do better. So um, I hope I answered your question. I went all... <laughs> Franklin, you could take us all the way around and we're going to follow you because you're, you're calling us to be better. You're calling us to do better. You're giving us the courage to say, I don't know and I want to know. And if I don't want to know, well, I need to want to know. And you're asking us to do some really, really powerful things. Your shirt, more than a music teacher. It, it, you live it. You live it, and you have lived it, and you're calling us to live it too. Franklin, we're coming up to the end of our time today, but are there any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? Um, yes. Social and emotional learning is not just a checklist. It's not give me a guide of how I can be social and emotionally aware as a teacher, right? And so... Scott can write all the books. He can do all the articles. You know, he can put all of this information out there. But until you accept the call as a music teacher to really be about this work, about building up young people, about um, allowing their voices to be heard, until you take that on as a mission, we can't help you, right? We, we, can't, we can't do this work for you. And a lot of people say, well, what's doing the work? It's getting in there, it's pulling up your, your shirt, getting your elbows dirty, feeling uncomfortable, feeling those moments of vulnerability. That's what it's about. And when you do that, you learn some life experiences and you learn some things that will carry you on. And when your students see you in that vulnerable space, they award you. Right? They may not give you a hand clap. They may not say, man, that was really a great lesson, Scott. That was really great. But you will see it in their body language. You will see it in their communication with other teachers. You will see it when they come into your classroom, the excitement on their faces. And then you will see it in years to come when they see you in the grocery store and they see you out and about. And they're like, y y you were my music teacher in fifth grade. I remember that song we did. And you're like, wow, so you did take those life lessons with you. Um, so in your journey to, to, to incorporate social and emotional learning, um, just realize that you might mess up and, and it's okay. But 
that mess up is going to be the thing that propels you to your next level of greatness. And so I'm excited to see, you know, where music education will continue to go. Um, we have some, some people who are really uh, uh, opening up the possibilities of what music education can be and what it can look like. And it doesn't have to look the same, right? And so um, that, that, that's, I guess, my final piece of this social emotional learning. And, and I'll say this, many times when we're doing this work, we don't realize that there's terminology for it, like culturally relevant teaching, culturally responsive teaching. I didn't learn those definitions in college. I just figured out through trial and error, like, wait a minute, if I'm with this population of students, I have to meet their needs. I have to speak their language. I have to meet them at their point of need, right? And then if I go over here to this, I can't do the same thing I did over here with these kids thinking it's going to work with this kid, <laughs> with these kids. So um, allowing yourself to grow and studying and researching and being a part of this new wave of music education. And I, I'm just, I'm excited to see what will happen um, because it, music education is part a lot of concern. We're, music teachers are the rock star. We make things happen. We we bring life into our school community. So um, I, I'm just thankful to be on on this conversation with you, and I hope that um, people walk away feeling empowered uh, to tell their story and to connect with their community. Franklin, from the bottom of my heart, from all of our hearts, your call to action is just so powerful. And you said there are people in our field who are opening up doors to change music education. And I firmly believe that there are very few who are doing it as powerfully as you. So thank you for the gift that you've given us to, to the profession, to your time that you've spent with us today. And my friend, I cannot wait till our paths cross again because I, I truly feel like we're on this journey together. Man, we've met virtually, but when we get together, we're going to have a great, great time, man. 100%, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> you be safe and be well, Franklin. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in their scholastic environment. Wow, I want to thank Franklin Willis for his amazing contribution to this series. More than just a contribution in thoughts, it's a call to action. It's a call to be better. It's a call to be humble and to want to improve for the good of our students. I'd like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out the Yamaha Educator Suite at yamahaeducatorsuite.com. And I want to thank GIA Publications for their continued support. Before we say goodbye, it is important to understand that now more than ever in these uncertain times that we continue to support our nonprofit organizations, including Music for All. If you enjoyed tonight's program, and in order for us to continue to provide our free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider gifting to Music for All at any amount. Your gift allows us to serve our mission with future educational programming, such as this event. Please visit musicforall.org backslash give. For Music for All, I'm Scott Edgar. Thank you.